Okay, well, let's get started. It's clear it doesn't take a minute to move this crowd to their seat, so I'll just get started anyway. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arvind Raman. I'm the Executive Associate Dean in the College of Engineering. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking time from what must be undoubtedly a really busy time of the semester for all of you to join us here for this event today. Uh, today is a joyful uh, event. Uh, we are gathered here to celebrate the impacts that our faculty are having in the larger world, outside Purdue, external to Purdue, uh, through their uh, field-defining research, transformative teaching and learning, uh, incredible engagement, and uh, tech transfer and commercialization entrepreneurship activities uh, as well. Uh, very specifically, we're looking at recognitions received between July 1st of last year and June 30th of uh, this year. Uh, and these are recognitions that our faculty have received for the tremendous impact they're having, uh, whether from professional societies, foundations, government, or from the market through their commercialization activities. And to kick the event off, uh, it gives me, it's a great honor for me to uh, invite uh, our Dean, Mark Lundstrom, the Don and Carol Skyfris Distinguished Professor of Electrical Computer Engineering. Mark, please. Thank you, Arvind, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and let me add my congratulations to all of our award recipients. Um, you all are examples of what it means to work at what our former dean and incoming president calls the pinnacle of excellence, and you really make us proud. So as you know, our college's goal is to be the nation's leading example of excellence at scale. And scale is about being true to our land-grant mission of providing as many students as we can with a high quality, affordable uh, education that prepares them for successful careers and successful lives. Now, we also strive for excellence in everything that we do, discovery, learning, engagement, and excellence that is second to none. And your examples of that kind of excellence. External awards uh, are important because great accomplishments should be recognized. We pay a lot of attention to external awards because they're a useful metric they tell us where we are on our climb to the pinnacle. Now, in fact, last year, the college undertook a fairly serious benchmarking exercise to understand how we compare to eight top engineering programs uh, in terms of awards designated by the National Research Council as highly prestigious or prestigious, as well as federal agency awards for early career researchers. Uh, the results were eye-opening. And they showed that we need to work harder to increase the number of faculty that we nominate and the faculty that receive these external awards. But there have been several developments over the past year that show that we're making progress. For example, 11 College of Engineering faculty members received NSF career awards this past year. That's a record for the college, and we look forward to surpassing that next year. 23 faculty members were elected to the rank of fellow or honorary or distinguished member of professional societies. And that's a number that has continued to grow for the past four years. Our Dean's Award Committee is working hard on an initiative known as Pathways to the Pinnacle to prepare faculty at the senior associate and full professor levels uh, for recognition at the pinnacle of excellence. And finally, our external uh, awards and recognitions program continues to work with the college leadership, the Dean's Awards Committee, the schools, to prepare almost 70 nominations a year and to provide faculty with a whole range of services to help them as they nominate their colleagues. So you should all celebrate. We're celebrating with you. But also think about what you can do to help your colleagues be recognized for the outstanding work that they do. You know, I know it feels good when your work is recognized, but I can tell you that it's also a real thrill when your nomination is successful from one of your colleagues. So congratulations once again, and uh, now I think we'll hear from a few of our colleagues about the work that has been recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, just wanted to uh, 
inform everyone, if you haven't taken a look at the booklet, uh, you know, to Mark's point, the number of these recognitions of our faculty has increased so much, we cannot possibly fit everybody into uh, this event, but everyone is uh, mentioned in this uh, booklet. Uh, but moving ahead, we'd like to, uh, we started this last year that it would be nice, uh, we heard that it would be nice uh, to actually have some of our distinguished uh, recipients, uh, honorees, speak to their experience and what they're doing. And so uh, we will do that now. And uh, we have selected uh, faculty who've had significant impact through commercialization, uh, through uh, tech transfer, uh, and through um, engagement activities, but also early career successes, uh, and also to recognize those who have been cited a lot, uh, thereby having an evidence on the impact uh, they have on the scientific community. Uh, so we've chosen uh, three colleagues who very generously agreed to share with us. Uh, uh, you know, their work and how they're having an impact. And uh, the first uh, speaker is going to be Professor Linda Wang. Uh, she was uh, the inductee, recent inductee last year into the National Academy of Inventors. Uh, she is the Maxine Spencer Nichols Professor in the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering. Uh, this past year, she was inducted into the NAI for her invention of new methods for the environmentally sustainable extraction and purification of rare earth metals from waste magnets, ores, and coal fly ash. Her induction also recognized her invention of new technologies for converting plastic waste into clean fuels and other useful products. Uh, please welcome Professor Wang. I'm very honored to be invited by uh, Mark and John to uh, give you a short presentation of uh, the work we're doing. So, um, the topic is the production of pure rare earth and battery elements from laboratory scale to pilot plant. And this is uh, a remarkable story, so I want to share some of the, the reasons for, for, the, for the success. So basically, the story is that we can scale up from 100 milliliter columns in the lab and did the pilot scale up a thousand times and tested the pilot and it was successful on first trial. So this, uh, you know, I want to share with you some of the key things for this success. So I will introduce to you about the critical elements, why they're important and what they are, and a, a very brief summary of the Purdue technologies and, uh, and then the potential impact uh, hopefully we see in the next uh, few years. So the rare earth elements are the scandium, yttrium, and lanthanide series, including about the 15 uh, elements uh, in this lanthanide series. The most important rare earth elements are the NDPR, DY, and uh, TB. These are the essential ingredients and permanent magnets which are used in your motors and many other high-tech uh, devices. And you probably all know that everybody wants to drive an electric car and the lithium, uh, the cobalt, nickel, uh, manganese, iron, copper, and aluminum. These are the critical elements for lithium ion batteries. And uh, these, uh, the, the, the rare earth elements, for example, they can make materials stronger, lighter, better, tools smaller, more efficient, and more powerful. One example is the, the motors or the, the, elect, uh, the batteries in electric cars and the motors in the wind turbine uh, devices. These all re require uh, rare earth elements. And uh, your TV screens and uh, your energy, uh, energy saving light bulbs, TV screens, uh, these all require rare earth elements. Uh, catalytic uh, converters, uh, you know, these are some of the few examples. Uh, so the, these rare earth are also very important for our defense. Uh, the targeting weapons, communication, guidance, control of electrical motors, they all require the permanent uh, magnets and rare earth elements. And some examples are the fighter jet requires about 0.4 tons of rare earth and destroyers about 2.4 tons and this, uh, and the Submarines require four tons uh, rare earth elements. So the, so the growing demand in the rare earth magnets causes a, a, a quick rise in the market uh, demand. Uh, you know, going from 100,000 tons per year to all the way to 300,000 tons by 2035. And these are mainly 
the mobility related tools, the motors in the cars, the uh, fuel, uh, common cars, hybrid cars, uh, wind turbines, et cetera. And uh, the, uh, you may know that the major producers of pure critical elements is China. So the, starting from about 40% to 90% of rare earth, uh, pure rare earth came from China. And uh, this control of the pure uh, materials has a serious implications. So we need to uh, produce these critical elements domestically instead of relying on foreign import. Uh, so the current path of the rare earth supply chain is from the minerals to concentrates. By solvent extraction, they purify into high purity rare earth elements. And these are the essential ingredients for all kinds of finished products. Although the rare earth is on $8 billion per year market share, but the products that require rare earth is more than $4 trillion per year. And uh, after one use, 99% of the rare earth is landfilled. So, uh, so the monopoly of this high purity rare earth means eventually the, mon the, the China, the producers of the rare earth will control the production of all the high tech uh, components or the final products. So this is a very critical uh, problem. So why we don't produce the rare earth uh, in, China, uh, in here uh, the, is the challenge is, is the following. The, these rare earth elements present in ores at very low concentrations and all the in the complex mixture. So to produce uh, them to purify to from a few percent to 99.5 percent purity requires uh, extensive work. And they all have the same valence, they have similar size and properties. So the, for example, in the conventional solvent extraction, they require a thousand mixer settler units like this. It's about the one meter in dimensions. And the worst is the discharge of the toxic waste into uh, the environment, into a six mile wide lake, for example, in northern China. And this is one of the 10 most polluted sites in the world. So the Purdue innovation is to replace the solvent extraction by chromatography. Why? Uh, the main reason is that chromatography has very high interfacial area per unit volume. So you can have a thousand square meters interfacial area in one gram of absorbance. And that imp implies that we can use a much smaller processing uh, volume to do the production. And compared to the solvent extraction, one mixer settler unit is about one meter in each dimension. Whereas in chromatography, we can, uh, in chromatography, we can uh, use, uh, going back, in chromatography, we can use one meter uh, column to achieve 1,000 equilibrium stages. So, uh, so this is the difference uh, in these two uh, methods. And also that this, you just pump fluid into a pack bed. So the energy requirement is very little instead of mixing like crazy to produce a few hundred micron droplets in the mixer settler solvent extraction uh, system. So the, the conventional available uh, exchange, uh, ion exchangers, for example, they don't have selectivity to separate the 17 rare earth elements. So the, the, you, you have chelating absorbents, they're not commonly available, very high cost and limited capacity and stability. So we, for, that's why we developed this ligand assisted displacement chromatography, which has used low cost ion exchange absorbent and selective ligands in the mobile phase. And uh, this has broad selectivity for all the rare earth elements. So just a quick introduction about what is ligand assisted displacement chromatography? So, uh, so I use a very simple analogy. I can convert the convergent center into a chromatography column. I'll put this floor on the top and many rooms, okay, we have thousand floors, let's say, and I can separate your, the, the group here uh, by, by a, a, a ligand assisted separation as this, okay? So ligand, they have very high selectivity for um, specific uh, molecules. So if you consider the, the ligand is a tango dancer, for example, it has a high preference dancing with certain guests with different colors. For example, I can make you uh, dress in gold like a 
dy rare earth or dress in pink like <laughs> nd uh, get a uh, rare earth or uh, green as a pr rare earth so if you imagine this thing has a thousand floors and everybody's on the top floor and each room uh, has an escalator going down. So once uh, you are out of the room, you can go escalators down, downhill very quickly. So I can invite the tango dancers to come in. And this tango dancers has very strong preferences for gold or for pink or for green uh, guests. And the most above all, the, this tango dancer likes copper the blue dressed uh, guests. So imagine you're on the top floor and uh, I can bring the, the, I can bring the, the guests into uh, this convergence center, which is full of blue guests. And uh, when I bring in this uh, guest, I bring in this group and uh, I can, uh, they can displace because you know they they are competitive for grabbing the sides, so they can push the, they can displace the blue guests forward and occupy the top floors. And I can bring the tango dancers uh, this way, and as the tango dancer comes in, because it will pick up the gold guests first, right? And so, the gold guests will spend more time dancing, and this, or the chance of getting out of the room and going to the escalator is very high. So as this process continues, you can see that you can separate these three guests uh, into different bands or different regions or concentrated with these elements. So this is the essence of the ligand-assisted uh, chromatography. So, so, so this, uh, in the next slides, you know, this is more scientific <laughs> uh, animation of the, the process. Uh, so the, this says that as you bring the guests, the blue uh, guests move forward, displaced by the, the pink, uh, I just have pink and green guests. As the, you bring in the tango dancer, gradually you can see that the, the pink guests will be moved forward ahead of the, the green gas region. So uh, eventually this, uh, this, uh, this process evolves and then eventually can see that you can see this, this is a pink guest, green guest, and the tango dancer group <laughs> following this. So this is a very simplistic analogy explaining what is the ligand assisted displacement chromatography. So, um, so the, Eventually, the, you have this we call the constant pattern isotactic train because you know all these bands are moving at the same speed, like the uh, the cars in in the train, uh, box cars in the train. So uh, the the challenge is to how to achieve this constant pattern because then you have very high, highly concentrated products with high purity and high yield. So the challenge is really to design this process. So there's, there was no general theory to predict how to design this process for, in general. So our contribution is to develop the first wave theory to uh, do this in a very quick way. We can uh, design the system. Just give you an example of the challenges. The parameters of the development of this constant pattern train is the length, for example, is depending on 3n plus 6 parameters. That means uh, if you have three component rare earth mixture, uh, that, that will, uh, the chance of on first trial, you can get, do this thing right, get the optimal solution is 14 million, more than 40 million. So the chance of one trial to get it done right is, is, is probably less than the chance you got struck by lightning. So, so the, that's the power of the, the, the theory is that we reduce this multi-dimensional space into a two-dimensional map. So this will, can be programmed so quickly we can, for any feedstock, any composition, any product you desire, we can quickly come up with an effective design. So this is the, the, the key uh, contribution to uh, develop large-scale systems, so from lab scale to uh, to the pilot scale. So the second uh, useful tool is our simulator. This is a called, the, this is like your digital process twin. So you can simulate the process in, in computers. 
So these tools allow us to develop very versatile, efficient, and scalable design. So you can, for any feedstock, uh, we, if we get the intrinsic parameters, which is scale independent, then we can put into the design tools and simulation tools to can quickly uh, design a lab scale process, and then we can uh, scale up uh, to uh, test it. And uh, so in this example, we have the 100 mil columns and this scaled up uh, to 150 liter columns, which is um, about, about over a thousand times. And the productivity, you can go going from 10 gram per, per day uh, to uh, 15 kilogram per day in one column uh, in the pilot scale. So uh, this example was for the, for the wind turbine uh, motor at the end of uh, life. We collect them, uh, crush them into uh, small particles, mill them and ox oxidize and roast it into oxides and uh, leaching with a weak acid into a leaching solution and that solution was purified using the chromatography methods into high purity rare earth and then that can be made into uh, magnets. So we also have uh, done successfully in the, in the lab scale to, uh, so far. So the end life lithium ion batteries, collect them, crush them, uh, calcinate to remove the binders, sieve them, leach them with a weak acid, and then uh, we can we use the, the Purdue methods to purify into nickel, cobalt, manganese, and lithium. Uh, so th this can be reused into the cathode materials for lithium ion batteries. So in summary, this this methods based on wave theories and intrinsic parameters and simulations. So this allows us to do a predictive design, which is adaptable to different feedstocks, different desired products, and different production scales. And uh, we have demonstrated the rare earth uh, in both the, the lab and the pilot scale. We demonstrated battery elements at the lab scale, and they sched uh, scheduled to uh, be demonstrated at the pilot scale in the, in the early 2023. So these technologies are safer because we, we have used uh, benign recyclable uh, chemicals, cleaner, more efficient, and more economical than solvent extraction. And in commercial production at the productivity about 30 tons of these elements per cubic meter per year, that means for to build a typical rare earth plant of 1,000 tons per year, we just need to scale up from the pilot to 40 times larger. For battery elements, uh, for 30,000 tons per year, we need to scale up to 1,000 times. And we're confident that this will succeed uh, at the, to scale up into the commercial scale. And we think this has potential to achieve a circular economy of the critical elements. So we can go from the minerals to, um, to the, after purification into the high purity elements made into products and at the end of life, uh, they don't go to the landfill and they can be repurified and reused. So thank you very much. Uh, we uh, really appreciate the strong support from the School of Chemical Engineering, Professor San Kim, and my postdoc, Yiding, uh, graduate students, uh, Schuster and Tao, and the uh, undergraduate students, Abala, uh, involved in the scale up effort. And the early work was supported by the NSF and the DLA. And, uh, but most importantly, we have very enthusiastic, visionary industrial partners, Real Element Technologies, and the, the CEO, the COO, and so on. And uh, the facility tour on the of this pilot video can be uh, viewed at uh, the website of the Real Elements. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Christopher Brinton. Uh, Chris Brinton is an assistant professor in the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His research is at the intersection of distributed computing, communication network optimization, and machine learning. In 2022, he achieved what we are calling the trifecta of early career uh, awards. He was a recipient of the NSF Career Award. Uh, the Office of Naval Researchers Young Investigator Award and the DARPA Young Faculty Award. Please welcome Professor Brenton. Well, thank you so much, Arvind, Mark, um, and John. Really appreciate you inviting me to do this. It's an honor to be speaking to you today. 
Um, I'd like to overview uh, some of the research going on in my lab, um, which we call ION. We'll understand what that means in a little bit. Um, so I work at the intersection of um, networking, computing, and machine learning. Um, so uh, start off, let's talk about the fact that there are billions, literally billions of edge devices today um, that are the edges of networks. Um, and there's an exponentially increasing amount of data generation in those networks as a result. That's literally exponential. It's not just an exaggeration. You trace it. It can be an exponential curve. And there's no question then that that's going to fuel advances um, in artificial intelligence. Um, so as a result, uh, we need to start thinking about how do we deliver that artificial intelligence to the end users. The end users actually have the data. Um, how do we bring the sophisticated modeling that's typically done um, in cloud servers, cloud data centers, um, to those users? This is a big objective of you know, fifth generation, sixth generation, next generation, whatever access, um, up to 7G in some cases today, wireless. Um, some examples being wearable health analytics, um, autonomous vehicles. Um, these will all um, certainly benefit from the delivery of AI, the availability of AI at the edge. There's two salient characteristics of these applications, however, that they're um, data intensive um, and they're also latency sensitive. So these two things sort of don't play well together, right? Um, we need to process more and more data in shorter and shorter amounts of time to be able to um, actually deliver this. So this brings us to the principle of fog networks. All right, so fog is um, concerned with the what we call the cloud to things continuum, um, from cloud data centers all the way out to the Internet of Things um, devices that are sitting at the network edge, and all of the computing infrastructure in between. Right, so it's really very, very large scale global type networks that we're talking about today, um, and we want them to be global because we want to be able to benefit from. Um, the vast amount of data that's being generated and collected all across these networks in different parts. But we have to understand how do we manage and how do we deliver this intelligence actually over fog. And so the current sort of state of the art technology um, for doing um, this type of distributed learning, if we distribute machine learning to the edge, um, is called federated learning. Um, federated learning is a very popular approach. Um, and the key innovation there was really, um, rather than transmitting data over the networks from the end devices all the way up to the cloud servers, um, we're going to transmit the models instead. Because um, the models are more private. Um, the models are also way, way less complex. Or are they? Because today, we're talking about millions and billions of parameters of neural networks anyway. So sometimes transmitting the models over these networks is already just as burdensome as even transmitting the data. We're talking about it from that perspective. So this brings us to three key challenges that exist when we try to think of federated learning in a fog setting. Um, this is uh, the heterogeneity in resources as well as data sets. Um, so all of our edge devices, they all have different processing capabilities. Um, they all have different statistical properties of their local data sets. Um, we also have to consider the unique topology of fog networks or the connectivity characteristics. You know, what devices are connected where. It's not this really nice sort of star topology from a server emanating all the way out to the devices. There's lots of, lots of stuff in between that we also have to account for. And finally, the proximity between devices can also be important, because um, that can have um, major implications to energy efficiency. So this brings us to this concept of unifying um, federated learning and, machine and fog computing. Um, we call it fog learning. Um, so fog learning aims to unify fog computing and AI and ML, and it's fundamentally concerned with jointly optimizing um, two different types of metrics. Um, one, on the one hand, we have the intelligence quality. What's the quality of the models we're delivering? How long does it take us to actually deliver that intelligence to end users? And on the other hand, we have resource efficiency, right? So how, much, how many network resources is it taking for us to actually do that, right? So we have to really understand this trade-off um, and we have to optimize over it as best we can. So my research really focuses on a lot of the design principles behind fog learning. Um, I won't go into um, all of the depth, but the idea is when you have a type of hierarchical structure like this, um, we'd like to distribute as much of it as possible throughout the network, um, not just the model update processes, but also even the model aggregation processes. Um, to do that, it, we also leverage state-of-the-art wireless communication technologies like device-to-device -device communications. So direct device-to-device -device is much lower cost, much more energy efficient, but potentially not as accurate as going from device all the way to server. 
right? So there's a lot of trade-offs that induces as well, but it's good to have that additional degree of freedom. And of course, as we consider the hierarchy of this structure, we have to be able to adapt how often we synchronize the devices at different layers according to the needs of the different tasks that are being run. So this leads to the, um, my lab, I call it the ION lab. This is intelligence optimization for networks. It's not a positively charged particle, though I like to, I like to think that my students are positively charged particles. Um, at least some of them are. So, um, so uh, research spans a few different disciplines. Um, we look broadly at um, using leveraging networks to improve AI and machine learning. Um, we also look at the other way around. How do we leverage AI and machine learning um, to improve networks? We like to draw this um, intersection point uh, between network science, wireless communications, and machine learning. Um, so we have, we're thankful to many government and industry sponsors, um, Office of Enabled Research, DARPA, NSF, on the industry side, um, Hewlett Packard, Intel, as well as Ford. Um, and I'd you know, certainly like to thank all of my students and um, you know, uh, postdocs, as well as just many, many collaborators um, that, that I have. And um, so this is the last slide I have. It's just a quick summary of sort of the research process that we tends to tends to really happen for any work uh, that that exists in my group. It's it's sort of a three step process, and we start by looking at uh, codifying relationships between AI and machine learning and fog networks. So how does the AI impact fog and vice versa? Um, how does changing certain control parameters in the fog system impact AI and ML and vice versa? Then leveraging that in the development of adaptive orchestration methodologies that are going to take into consideration energy efficiency as well as um, computing capabilities as well as the machine learning task that's being run. And finally, importantly, evaluations on real world deployments. So we always make sure we budget enough uh, for to buy equipment um, that hopefully students learn how to use and collect data. And we can um, you know, run our algorithms and then have this sort of feedback loop. Um, not just a feedback loop, um, from theory to practice, um, you know, in the actual uh, deployment itself, but also in our minds and in our thinking, a feedback loop over a longer time scale um, of how uh, we leverage the results that we see to further improve our theories and vice versa. So that, uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Someone's left a cell phone here. Is that you, Linda? Uh, next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Lothian Dao. Um, Lothian Dao is a Charles, Charles Davidson Associate Professor in the Davidson School of uh, Chemical Engineering. His research explores organic, inorganic, hybrid semiconductor materials and devices with the goal of developing new types of hybrid materials that leverage the performance of inorganic materials and the processability of organic materials. For three years now, Professor Dow has been named to Clarivate's annual list of highly cited researchers with multiple papers in the top 1% of citations in their field and year. Uh, please welcome Lothian Dow. Thank you, Professor Roman, for the wonderful introduction. And also, I'd like to thank College of Engineering for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share some of our recent work. Well, today, I would like to introduce a new uh, type of hybrid semiconductor material. Okay, so here's the, uh, the, the title of the talk. Okay. So in my group, we are interested in developing a uh, new type of materials that are easily processable at the same time has high performance. As we know, uh, currently uh, in the industry, um, Conventional uh, semiconductor materials such as silicon uh, requires a very uh, high temperature, very complicated process to produce. And those materials are very sensitive to defects, so you have to make them extremely pure, otherwise the device won't work. Right? And on the other hand, organic semiconductors has attracted lots of attention over the past three to four decades. Lots of progress has been made because organic materials are, uh, can be synthesized at a low temperature, very easy to uh, process. You can make, like, dissolve them in organic solvent and then can coat uh, high quality thin films and make variable uh, flexible devices. 
Uh, but on many cases, the performance of organic semiconductors cannot compete with inorganic. That's mainly uh, limited by the intrinsic uh, low charge carrier mobility in organic molecules. Right? So the dream is to combine the advantages from the two worlds, right? to make new materials that are easily processable, but as good as the inorganic materials like silicon. So luckily, uh, about 10 years ago, people found this material called halide perovskite. So great promise. And these materials have a, a very classic, this ABX3 type of perovskite crystal structure. So many uh, of the outside materials crystallize in this form and widely use, useful in superconductors and ferroelectric materials. Right? But interestingly, if you use uh, the combination of lead and the halide, it shows a, a wonderful optical and electronic properties and almost ideal for solar cell LEDs and many optoelectronic device applications. At least some of the uh, semiconductor parameters here, I won't go through the detail, but basically I want to show that uh, this material is obviously much better than conventional uh, other type of uh, thin film semiconductors, and some of the properties are approaching single crystal in silicon. For example, for solar cell, people are very excited about this. So the efficiency of a per solar cell are, is approaching 26% power conversion efficiency, almost the same as single crystal in silicon, uh, much better than polycrystal in silicon. But this material is solution processable because of the ionic crystal lattice. It dissolves inorganic solvent, so you can play with it just like playing with organic molecules. But at the same time, it crystallizes into perfect uh, thin films and generates this great device performance. And also, I want to highlight that this performance was achieved in a polycrystalline thin film, not like silicon, which you require 99.99999% 99 .99 purity in the single crystals. So they are very uh, easily scalable. That is related to this uh, so-called defect tolerance nature of these materials. Because of this uh, crystal uh, polarity is large, it's more like an ionic compound. So lots of the defects are very shallow or even inside the conduction or valence band, make the, the middle of the gap very clean so that this, those defects will not trap the charge carriers and kill the device performance. So that's a very unique feature of a halide perovskite material. And because of those amazing properties, lots of progress has been made in, in, in many fronts. For example, people are very excited about solar cells. The efficiency is so high, and the, the research is in the transition stage, and hopefully it will be uh, commercialized in the next few years. At the same time, the light emitting diode uh, device performance is also catching up. And even more interestingly, because of lead and iodine, those heavy elements, these materials interact with X-ray and gamma ray strongly. So it's almost a perfect material for uh, X-ray or uh, detector or scintillator as well, and very useful for uh, security and, uh, and medical applications. And very recently, the field effect transistor performance also uh, started to ramp up, and the whole mobility now uh, uh, is above 50 uh, centimeters square per volt per second. It's better than most of the uh, conventional uh, outside uh, thin film transistor materials. Now. So it seems that this is very exciting uh, material. So it works for, for everything, basically. But what, what's the problem with it? Uh, the key problem is the intrinsic low uh, stability. So because of the, the weak light halide bond, it makes things soluble. It can easily uh, uh, process, processable. But it's, at the same time, the weak bonding makes the materials uh, not very stable. So basically, it decomposes and uh, all kinds of external stimuli, for example, moisture, light, and heat. Um, so in addition to chemical decomposition, there's another unique feature. It's called ion migration or diffusion. You never see this in, in conventional semiconductor materials, but it's, uh, it's a big problem here in Porsche. Because of the ionic uh, solid, there are lots of vacancies in the solid. And then the ions can move through the vacancies. And this, this uh, uh, migration can happen under electrical bias. And, and that's why you see this uh, big hysteresis in the device IV curve. If you scan the device along two different directions, this IV curve does not uh, overlap. That is because the ions are moving slower in the device. And you can visualize this, pro uh, this uh, pro process uh, optically. And th this is very obvious, very fast. So here is the uh, uh, head of structure. The, the blue part is uh, a chloride-based uh, porosky, and the green part is a uh, bromide-based porosky. They emit different colors. We make a head of structure. If you heat up uh, at uh, around 75 degrees C, this is not very high, not critically high. You can see after a few hours, the junction disappears. So the bromine and iodine, they interdiffuse into each other, each other very quickly. So this is a huge problem. And how to increase the 
intrinsic stability for Halo ProSky is critically important uh, for the commercialization. Right? So in my group, we are developing the next generation, the better ProSky materials. And we, we are trying to combine uh, organic semiconductor building block into the ProSky uh, to make the so-called OSIP. I think the short name is pretty cool. Uh, so I always joke that uh, we know 2D materials is exciting, organic materials is exciting, and ProSky is super exciting. Now this OSIP combine everything is super exciting, <laughs> triple the excitement. Um, yeah, so in my group, we, we do all the way from material synthesis, uh, characterization to a variety of device applications. So today, I just uh, give a very brief uh, overview, uh, highlight some of our recent work. Uh, for example, we, in this work, we designed a series of these organic semiconducting uh, moieties and incorporated them into the uh, 2D ProS guide. We indeed got a very nice single crystals. We can confirm it forms a ProS guide structure. And now um, we, are, we are able to control the property not only by tuning the inorganic part, we are also uh, able to change the molecular design to, to change the optical and electronic properties for this hybrid material. And also because of the, the, uh, the, the protection effect of these organic ligands, the porous sky materials are very, very stable. They are waterproof. They do not decompose in water, and they do not decompose under high temperature, even like a 200 degrees C. So intrinsically stable. Now with this building block, we start to um, con uh, connect them laterally or vertically to create more complex structures and to understand the fundamental properties in those uh, heterostructures. Uh, for example, in this work, we demonstrate the first atomically sharp uh, 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 lateral epitaxial heterostructures between different halide perovskite, and we are able to stop the iron migration, the interdiffusion in those heterostructures, and create uh, very complex heterostructures laterally. And we also have lots of beautiful TEM images. Uh, if you're interested, you can uh, take a look at this paper. And for the vertical uh, stacking, uh, the fabrication is very easy, straightforward. Uh, this is nothing surprising. But indeed, once we put them together, a lot of interesting uh, physical properties show up. For example, in this work, we discovered a unique layer by layer interdiffusion process between the iodine and the bromine. Uh, ions uh, across this uh, this uh, this uh, 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 interface. Be due to the limitation of time, I won't be able to talk about the details. But if you are interested in solid state diffusion, uh, please take a look at this paper. And these materials are also useful in device, as I, I mentioned earlier. So here we apply those materials to, to the OSIP into the solar cells to in increase the charge extraction and help to improve the power conversion efficiency of a perovskite solar cell. So in my lab, we are able to make uh, near 25% power conversion efficiency and also uh, greatly enhance the stability. And these materials are naturally uh, quantum wells, organic and inorganic hybrid quantum wells. It confines the axons and uh, helps uh, uh, improve the light emission. So we are able to make a very efficient light emitting diode using those hybrid quantum wells as well. So in this work, we demonstrate color tunable uh, red uh, light emitting diode with uh, external quantum efficiency over 25%. It's approaching the best uh, organic uh, uh, light emitting diode right now. But there's still lots of room to further improve the efficiency and the stability uh, for this uh, device. Yeah, I think my time is up. I want to, uh, hopefully I have convinced you that OSIF is a very exciting new type of hybrid semiconductor materials. There's plenty of chemistry and physics to study, and also uh, there's plenty of uh, device applications we can, we can push forward. And finally, I would like to thank my students, postdocs, and wonderful collaborators both internally at Purdue and also externally uh, for their uh, strong support. And also thanks funding agencies and thanks College of Engineering and the School of Chemical Engineering for the support. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, to present the next set of recognitions, I'd like to invite Professor Chari Savran to the stage, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and the new incoming director of the John Martinson Center for Entrepreneurship. Welcome, Chari. Okay, good afternoon. I'm uh, very pleased to be here today to present the uh, College of Engineering's most impactful inventors of fiscal year 2022. The College of Engineering established this segment of the uh, annual recognitions event to acknowledge the successes uh, through patent licensing, technology transfer, and startups are a critical measure 
of uh, external impact and a recognition of our faculty's ingenuity. According to a recent report released uh, just this past September by the Intellectual Property Owners Association and the National Academy of Inventors, we received, as Purdue, we received 169 patents, uh, placing us first in both the state of Indiana and the Big Ten, and the sixth in the world. You can applaud. Right? <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and you got to keep in mind that uh, uh, we're, we rank sixth in the world, and uh, you got to keep in mind that uh, uh, some organizations that are ranked higher than us are actually systems of universities, not necessarily individual universities. Despite that, we're ranked uh, number six in the world. College of Engineering faculty members are a driving force behind these milestones. The products they are bringing to the marketplace are uh, driving major advances in the fields of energy, pharmaceuticals, biotech, agriculture, aerospace, nutrition, and many more, and ultimately are changing lives. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to share with you uh, some of the ways the John Martinson Entrepreneurial Center of the College of Engineering supports the efforts of engineering faculty as well as students to commercialize new technologies. Okay. John Martinson Entrepreneurial Center was uh, enabled by generous and uh, recurring donation of John Martinson himself, uh, a Purdue engineering alum, to bolster startup creation and the overall entrepreneurial ecosystem in the College of Engineering. Uh, actually has a funny story. Uh, John uh, uh, did his uh, master's here in Air Astro, and uh, all he wanted was to become an astronaut. Uh, and uh, they told him he couldn't because he was too tall. And then he said, well, let me go into business. And he, became, he actually went into business and became very successful. Uh, and uh, to, to that end, uh, we assist uh, students as well as uh, faculty-based startups in a spectrum of ways, uh, including direct investment in the companies for which we work directly with the PRF, uh, providing office space in the Wang Hall. Many of you know where the Wang Hall is, on the fourth floor. Uh, we have a space there we can provide uh, office space uh, for our budding companies, personal awards to students uh, by pitch competitions, as well as networking our uh, budding companies with the entrepreneurial ecosystems in the Silicon Valley, as well as the Boston areas, okay? We also have, as many of you may know, entrepreneurial ambassadors in every school of engineering, uh, and these are faculty members, to help us with these endeavors, okay? So uh, I now would like to uh, proceed with the presentation of the College of Engineering's uh, most impactful inventors. We are recognizing several categories of uh, uh, faculty uh, inventors who have developed Purdue IP, which is now in various stages of commercialization. I will ask the audience to hold the applause until I have announced all the names. Uh, and uh, once I've done so, then I will ask the inventors to stand up uh, for a round of applause, okay? So uh, the first category of uh, inventors are College of Engineering faculty members who are commercializing their technologies through their own startup endeavor, okay? Uh, and endeavors that are established in the fiscal year 2022, and again, based on Purdue IP. The inventors in this category are Mang Tree for Photomatrix, Dimitri Parolis for Jones Microwave, Willis Paul for Valgotech, Ken Sandhage for BioVoli, and Yang Xin for Computational Manufacturing, okay? The second category, uh, of our most impactful inventors includes companies based on College of Engineering faculty intellectual property that crossed the threshold of $500,000 in external funding, again, in fiscal year 2022, just in fiscal year 2022. The faculty members in this category are Sherry Harbin and Jenna Rickus for Genifis, Jackie Linus, Tamara, Ken Tamara Kinzer Ursum, and Steve Worley of Omnivis, Luna Lu for WaveLogics, and Linda Wang for American Resources Corporation. Okay. Um, we're not finished. Uh, the third category of inventors are, again, College of Engineering faculty members whose technology was the basis for a new license that was signed with an existing company in fiscal year 2022. The inventors in this category provided key contributions to facilitate the transfer of their technology to an entity that is making significant investments in developing the technology and implementing the technology in the marketplace. The inventors are Rakesh Agrawal, Rajamani Gounder, Gerard Klemek, Tilman Kobes, Jeffrey Miller, Zoltan Naj, Fabio Ribeiro, Jeffrey Cirola, John Sutherland, Min Mitunah Toti Toti, T. N. Vijay Kumar, Linda Wang, 
and you were not ye. Okay. The fourth category of innovators are faculty members who had US patents issued, again, only in 2022 with a corporate partner. The inventors in this category have received issued patents that either have been exclusively licensed by a non-startup entity or are jointly owned with the industry. And the inventors are Vanit Agarwal, Jan Alabak, Charles Bauman, Ellen Garner, Tilman Kobes, Carlos Martinez, Fabio Semperlotti, Stephen Sun, T. N. Vijay Kumar, Mituna Toti Toti, Jeffrey Youngblood, and Song Zhang. Okay. So I will now invite all the inventors who have been named to please stand, and I ask the audience to join me in a round of applause. I will now introduce Dr. Alina Ali Alexienko, uh, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education, who will begin the welcoming of new College of Engineering faculty members. Thank you. Thank you, Chadi. So it is my great pleasure to um, welcome, officially, 28 faculty members who have started their positions at the College of Engineering in 2022. I will ask everyone to hold their applause until we have announced all the new faculty members. So first, um, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Stefan Wheeler, Harold T. Armin, uh, Distinguished Professor of Industrial Engineering, School of Industrial Engineering and Cranard School of Management. Dr. Biller joins us from Advanced Manufacturing International where he served as the CEO. He received his PhD in industrial engineering and um, management sciences from Northwestern University. One of his main priorities at Purdue will be to establish a national strategy for AI-driven digital manufacturing to increase the resiliency and efficiency of supply chains. And Hitesh Bindra, Associate Professor, School of Nuclear Engineering. Dr. Bindra comes to us from Kansas State University, where he was an Associate Professor of Mechanical and Nuclear Engineering. He received his PhD in Nuclear Engineering from University of Illinois at Urbana-Campaign. His research interests include nuclear reactor safety, thermal fluid sciences, statistical learning, and energy storage. Bizad, Esmaili, Associate Professor, School of Industrial Engineering and the Lyle School of Civil Engineering. Dr. Esmaili joins us from George Mason University, where uh, he was an assistant professor in the College of Engineering and Computing. He earned his PhD in Civil Engineering uh, from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dr. Esmaili's um, research focuses on human factors, human AI teaming, smart occupational safety, and risk and decision making. Yining Feng, a research assistant professor, Lyle School of Civil Engineering. Dr. Feng um, joins the Purdue faculty after completing doctoral and postdoctoral research here in the Lyle School of Civil Engineering. Her research will focus on sustainable infrastructure and environmental health through the development of a multidisciplinary research program in nanomaterials and related device technology. David Gilde Meister, Associate Professor of Engineering Practice, School of Materials Engineering. Dr. Gilde Meister received his PhD in Material Science and Engineering from Carnegie Mellon. He comes to us from Arconic, where he was a casting technical specialist. Dr. Gilde Meister, uh, expertise is in aluminum casting and solidification, manufacturing methods, and metallurgy. Yang Gu, Associate Professor, School of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Gu received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Purdue University and went on to hold an assistant professorship at University of Massachusetts at Lowell. Her research in robotics aims to achieve versatile and energy efficient robot locomotion in complex environments. Chi Gu, Assistant Professor Elmer, Elmer Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. 
Dr. Guo comes to us from Harvard University, where he earned um, where he earned a PhD in electrical engineering. His expertise is in computer vision, computational photography, machine learning, and optics. Vijay Gupta, Professor Elmer Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Dr. Gupta joins us um, from the University of Notre Dame, where he was jointly appointed as a professor of electrical engineering and of aerospace and mechanical engineering. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from uh, Caltech. Dr. Gupta's research interests are in the broad area of distributed decision making using both data driven and model driven approaches. Beth Hess, Associate Professor of Engineering Practice, School of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Hess earned her PhD from Purdue School of Mechanical Engineering after eight years in industry with Med Institute. Dr. Hess returned to Purdue to pursue a career in teaching and she uh, has acquired expertise in innovative approaches to undergraduate teaching and encouraging student success. And it now, um, um, I, uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Robert Frosch, uh, Senior Associate Dean for Engin uh, of Engineering for Facilities and Operation to continue. Yeah, thank you, Elena. Uh, continuing on, uh, we have Beth Holloway, uh, Professor of Practice, School of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Holloway earned her PhD in engineering education here at Purdue and currently serves in the College of Engineering as Assistant Dean for Diversity and Engagement and the Leah H. Jamison Director of Women in Engineering. Her areas of research and practice include diversity in engineering, admissions practices, and women in leadership. Mohammed Mustafa Hussein, professor of the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Dr. Hussein joins the College of Engineering from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, where he was the professor of electrical engineering. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. His research interests are in the design, development, and manufacturing of a wide range of futuristic electronics. Kevin Kersher. Assistant Professor, School of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Kirscher joins us from MIT where he conducted post-doctoral research. Dr. Kirscher received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Cornell University. His research focuses on smart buildings with a particular focus on heating and cooling systems and their interaction with the electricity grid. Tillman Kubis the Catherine Nye Pesek and Silvaco Associate Professor in the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Dr. Kubis received his PhD in physics from the Technical University of Munich. He previously held the position of Catherine Nye Pesek and Silvaco Research Assistant Professor of Electrical Engineer and Computer Engineering here at Purdue. Dr. Kubis' expertise is in computational nanotechnology, many particle physics, and quantum transport modeling. Keith Legrand, Assistant Professor, School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Dr. Legrand received his PhD in aerospace engineering from Cornell University. Before joining the College of Engineering, Dr. Legrand was a senior member of the technical staff of Sandia National Laboratories. His expertise is in multi-object tracking, space domain awareness, and information theoretic control. Kane Lee, Assistant Professor in the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering. Dr. Lee joins us from the Polytechnic Montreal, where he conducted postdoctoral research. Dr. Lee received his PhD in Chemical Engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. His expertise is in process systems. Hu Shin Lee, Professor, School of Aeronautics and Astronautics and the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Dr. Lee comes to us from the University of Tennessee, where he was a professor of electrical engineering and computer science. Dr. Lee received his PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton University, and his areas of expertise are in wireless communications, cyber physical systems, and signal processing. Shi Lu, associate professor in the School of Nuclear Engineering. Dr. Lu joins us from Auburn University, where he was an associate professor of materials engineering. 
He received his PhD from Georgia Tech in material science and engineering, and his areas of expertise are in additive manufacturing, nuclear structure materials, material degradation in extreme environments, and irradiation effects. Jason McKenney, Associate Professor in the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Dr. McKenney received his PhD from our own School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He comes to us from the US Naval Research Laboratory where he served as head of microwave photonics. His expertise is in microwave photonic systems and applications. I will now turn it over to Dr. Weinstein, Associate Dean of Graduate Education. Thank you, Robert. Continuing with our new faculty, we have Jason Morphew. There we go. Um, assistant professor in the School of Engineering Education. Dr. Morphew received his doctorate in educational psychology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He previously served as a visiting assistant professor of engineering education and curriculum and instruction uh, here in the College of Engineering. His areas in, of research include uh, uh, learning from both embodied cognition and constructivist perspectives, and how students interact with learning technologies. Kenshiro Oguri, assistant professor from the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Dr. Oguri joins us from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he conducted postdoctoral research. He received his PhD in Aerospace Engineering Sciences from the University of Colorado Boulder. His areas of expertise are in trajectory optimization, space, spacecraft guidance, navigation and control, space mission design, and stochastic optical control. Taimur Kazi, assistant professor in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, Dr. Kazi comes, uh, comes to us from the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a postdoctoral fellow. He obtained his PhD from the Technical U University of Berlin, his areas of expertise are in biomaterials, polymeric hydrogels, tissue engineering, musculoskeletal regeneration, and 3D cellular interactions. Dr. Kurt Ristroff, assistant professor in the School of Agricultural and Bio, uh, Biological Engineering. Dr. Ristroff joins us from Carnegie Mellon University, where he conducted postdoctoral research as a Schmidt Science Fellow. He earned his PhD in chemical engineering and material science from Princeton University, and his areas of expertise are in scalable nanomaterials for drug and agrochemical delivery. Shiva Sitaraman, assistant professor in the School of Industrial Engineering. Dr. Sitaraman received her PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Notre Dame. Before arriving at Purdue, she conducted postdoctoral research at Texas A&M University. Her research interests lie at the intersection of control theory and machine learning uh, for distributed decision-making in large-scale cyber physical human systems with applications to transport networks, power grids, and interdependent infrastructures. Young Jun Sun, James J. Solberg Head and Randsburg Professor of the School of Industrial Engineering. Dr. Young Jun Sun comes to us from the University of Arizona where he served as Professor and Head of Systems and Industrial Engineering. Dr. Sun earned his PhD in Industrial and Manufacturing Engineering from Penn State University. His areas of expertise are in modeling and simulation of complex systems, smart manufacturing systems, and human decision-making. Next, we have Steven Steinhuber, professor in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Steinhuber joins us from the Scripps Research Translational Institute, where he served as the director of digital medicine. Dr. Steinhuber received his uh, doctor of medicine from St. Louis University and his areas of expertise including, uh, include the implementation of science of digital health technologies and cardiovascular conditions. Ziran Wang, assistant professor in the Lyle School of Civil Engineering. Dr. Wang received his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of California in Riverside. 
He joins us from Toyota Motor North America, where he worked as a principal researcher. His areas of expertise are in digital twins, autonomous driving, and human-machine interaction. Matthew Ward, assistant professor in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Ward joins us after holding the position of research assistant professor in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering here at Purdue. He also earned his PhD in biomedical engineering here, and so he just can't leave. And his areas of expertise are in bioelectronic medicine, neuroelectronic interfaces, and autonomic uh, neurophysiology. And last but not least, uh, Ti Wei Wei, Assistant Professor of the School of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Wei comes to us from Stanford University where he conducted his postdoctoral research. He received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the Inter-University Microelectronics Center and the Catholic Universität Leuven. His areas of expertise include semiconductor interconnects, advanced packaging, electronic cooling, and heterogeneous integration. So at this point, I invite all of our new faculty members who are here to please stand. And I'll ask everyone to join me in wel welcoming them to the College of Engineering with a boisterous round of applause. Thanks so much. And I'll turn it back over to Arvind for conclusion. Uh, and now we're at the end of our event. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone to stay for the reception. And in the meantime, we're actually going to cycle slide by slide each of the 100 plus recognitions that our faculty have received. So please uh, join us all here at the back and uh, we'll continue the celebration. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming.
Mm-hmm. 